Grant Miller is going to um, pick up some of the themes that Desiree had um, already raised on behavior change. Um, uh, and Grant is um, one of our, is another of our non-physician speakers, and so helps us think broadly about health. And then we are, and then I want everybody who has a question for Desiree to please write it down right now, because we are then going to come back and we'll have both of them come up and take a salvo of questions from the audience. Grant Miller. Thank you all very much. <clears throat> it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, before I start, I should just know what I'm doing. I'm not sure I see an advancer for the slides. Um, oh, it's perfect. OK. So it means we can't go back, or it's very hard to go back. I, yeah, thank you. Um, anyway, let me, <clears throat> let me just say I hope what I'm going to be able to talk with you about this morning is a, is a strong compliment to the, um, to the last presentation, and uh, I'm hoping we'll have productive discussion. So even though I don't think it was planned that way, I'm actually, uh, I think it's a great choice that we have a chance to take some questions together. Um, I think it'll be, I think it'll be good. Um, so I, I also just like to say somehow I seem to have found myself to a state of affairs where I spend a lot of time not really hanging out with people that actually care that much about health anymore. Uh, and so on a personal level, I'll say outside of uh, other reasons why it's wonderful to be with you, it really feels like I've come home. In fact, it makes me wonder why I left um, when, I, uh, when I come to a place like this. So if you don't know me, uh, please do uh, come and find me. I would love to, to know all of you here much better than I do. Um, so on paper, what I'm talking to you about today is a, uh, a new project. As you can see, the title is Reducing Anemia Through Rice Fortification in India. Um, by way of disclaimer, this is actually a project for which there are not findings yet that I'm going to tell you about. So if you want to get up and leave, you wouldn't hurt my feelings at the same time. I will tell you about some other real research that has finished along the way. But the reason why I decided to talk about this, outside of the fact that I'm excited about it, is that I wanted to tell you about my thought process that led me to this project, and I want to explain why exactly I'm so excited about this project. Because I think it touches on some broader issues that I want to frame for you that are quite important in global health, whether you agree or not. And selfishly, I'll also say, um, it's something that I'm uh, in my free time working on a book on as well, and so I'm really interested to know your thoughts. Um, good. So with that, I think I uh, would like to start here. This is probably one of my favorite slides that I've ever made in my life. Um, and I wanted to start with a very bold assertion here, which is that health choices are about more than health. Uh, and how do I know this as a ruthless empiricist? I know this because I like to eat cheeseburgers. Um, now, um, I'm a guy who uses a lot of numbers. I work in a medical school. I don't actually know the precise risk increment, say, for cardiovascular disease that I take on myself every time I eat a cheeseburger. Um, but I have a pretty good idea it's not good for me when I choose to do it. Uh, it's not the case that I'm anemic, given what's thematically topical for the moment, and so I need the red meat or something like that. Um, I do it because I just really enjoy it, and my apologies to those of you who are vegetarian as well. Um, and the point here is that I care about health, but I care about other things too, and I don't want health at any cost. I'm willing to trade off some things for health in the name of being a happy person, given what I prefer personally. I have a pretty good reason for doing it, would be another way of saying it. And so to jump a few steps ahead, an implication of this assertion, if you agree with me, uh, given that people often have pretty good reasons for doing what they do, is that the more an intervention requires behavior change, the harder it is. Um, I think that's very consistent with what you've already heard, and um, it's, it's certainly my point of view anyway. The more an intervention requires behavior change, the harder it is. Okay, so to bring us uh, away from silly cheeseburgers and a little bit closer to global health, this is uh, a spectrum of global coverage rates among various at-risk populations. Uh, for a variety of health technologies, largely household health technologies. It, it actually, I believe, I hope now, having gone through this, that there are not good readily available statistics on these coverage rates globally. So Iran Ben David, a colleague whom I'm sure you all know, and a bunch of students worked on trying to produce these. Not an easy task. 
And I'm not going to try to argue that any one of these numbers is exactly right. What I really care about is sort of where on this spectrum these various technologies fall. And what I would suggest to you is that the technologies that are in the right end of that spectrum there tend to be ones that require little to no behavior change. And the ones that tend to be down in the left end of that spectrum, sorry for some of the acronyms, uh, insecticide-treated bed nets, for example, um, improved cook stoves, one that I've worked on quite a lot, they tend to fall in the left tail of that spectrum. Um, which is consistent with this assertion that the more behavior change required, the harder it is. So this certainly doesn't cinch it. There's nothing I could show you in 20 minutes that would cinch it. I will suggest to you that if you start to scratch a little bit farther, that uh, there's a variety of deeper evidence, I think, that's consistent with this as well. Um, something else that I do in my free time is I do these very intensive observational studies about historically, what have various health innovations contributed to population health improvement? And I think a finding from a body of work around this um, is the statement I have for you here. Um, uh, I think one could build a very reasonable case that many of the most successful large-scale population health initiatives throughout history have generally been ones that don't actually try to modify behaviors at all. Um, in fact, they often instead involve working with what people would choose to do for themselves anyway and try to focus on modifying environments. And there are a variety of ways in which you may connect with this in your own work. For example, if you think about harm reduction efforts in areas of public health that I work on much less. Here are some examples that I know a little bit better. Historically, certainly in urban areas, water system disinfection and sewage treatment. Uh, DDT spraying, certainly uh, mid 20th century. Um, vaccinations, uh, micronutrient fortification. Um, so I can take my kids to the grocery store, um, not Whole Foods, I'll tell you, because I've looked, but other grocery stores, and I can buy for them a box of Fruit Loops, um, and my wife will kill me, and my kids will get a bunch of junk in those Fruit Loops, but they'll also get a lot of essential vitamins and minerals. They'll be getting something that's good for their health when they're not choosing something purposely because it's good for their health, um, and that's because uh, of the fortification of ingredients involved in making those Fruit Loops. So that brings me then to uh, the key project that I did want to talk to you about today. Um, uh, and this is one of the challenge of dealing with uh, anemia in the Indian state of Tamil Nadu, or India more generally, if you like. So um, if you're not that familiar with India, it's one of India's wealthiest states. It's located in the south. Um, despite the fact that it's one of the wealthiest, uh, it's actually a place where, unlike, where, like a lot of the poorer states, micronutrient deficiency rates are really just astonishingly high, astonishing, astonishingly to me anyway. Um, uh, micronutrient deficiency rates are extremely high, and our focus, as you know now, really is on anemia, specifically among these. Um, there are many causes of anemia. Uh, the predominant one in this context is iron deficiency. So this is a state of about 80 million people, right? It's as big as the country in its own right, um, depending on how you look at it. 60% of kids under five are anemic. Uh, more than half of pregnant women are also anemic. So um, I'm an economist, I'm not a real doctor, as my daughter tells me all the time, and so I think you understand much better than I do what the real harms of this are. Uh, for anemia among kids, uh, the consequences for human capital accumulation over the life cycle is pretty devastating. Um, anemia can lead to lifelong cognitive impairment and reduced earnings. Among pregnant women, uh, of course, anemia uh, elevates mortality risk associated with childbirth. Okay, so there's this big problem. What is India and what is Tamil Nadu trying to do about this? Um, the predominant approach to dealing with anemia and iron deficiency anemia in India, and it's true of Tamil Nadu as well, is supplementation through uh, iron tablets, uh, vitamins you might think of these as, and uh, micronutrient powders. And these are provided all over the place, and there have been programs around that have done this for a long time, uh, through daycare centers, through schools, through health centers, through community health workers. Um, I will assert that on the face of it, there does seem to be some evidence that the current approach is actually not working that well, uh, for whatever reason. 
Um, and I'll also point out that uh, even something like taking vitamins requires regular, even daily user engagement or behavior change. Um, and so I'll point to the lessons from global population health history that I was just trying to highlight for you a short while ago. Um, how far can you really go with vitamin supplementation? Um, I will tell you something that was very formative in shaping my own thinking about this. Um, so I, uh, a few years ago, I, I did a very large uh, randomized controlled trial in rural China in the northwest, the poorest part of China, where iron deficiency anemia is also a serious problem. Um, and in this randomized controlled trial, we were focused on creating very strong supply side incentives for doing something about anemia. And in the predominant technology available in northwest China is uh, vitamins. Um, so uh, I have to say, since I'm an economist, uh, outside of the compelling nature of trying to do something to more effectively address anemia, I was really interested in these sort of esoterical mechanism design issues embedded in how exactly do you structure a pay for performance incentive, right? So there are all kinds of things that are interesting here uh, intellectually. Uh, well, if you reward this but not that, you might get more of this but you might even get less of that and on balance are you better or worse off, uh, not so clear. If you reward something that is not directly under a person's control, the person you're rewarding, then maybe they won't actually try that hard anyway. Um, you could imagine if you reward people for following a checklist, do A, B, C, D, E, and F, then people will do A, B, C, D, E, and F under the optimistic scenario. But there, what you're really doing is you're not allowing for local people who understand the areas in which they work much better than you or me, for sure, uh, from using what they know that we don't know about what's gonna work in their local area and finding some innovative new way to, to do things. I was interested in all of these sort of fascinating intellectual questions, but I think we kind of missed the boat. Um, and here's why I think we kind of missed the boat. Um, if you think of what we did is we, we created strong bribes for, uh, for primary schools, principals, and teachers to do something about anemia, we were only, about, we were only able to reduce anemia by about one third. So that, that's not bad. Um, maybe it's not a bad deal, but it certainly doesn't get you all the way there. And this is with this sort of unsustainable at large scale, very large scale bribe program that we had running. Um, I think you might also argue, um, and I won't die on this hill, but I think you could argue that delivery and compliance are probably easier in rural China than in uh, many parts of South Asia as well. So how far can one go with vitamin supplementation? I'm not sure one can go uh, terrifically far, and I'm not sure you can look at countries that don't have anemia, iron deficiency anemia today, and say they got there by getting millions upon millions of people to take vitamins all the time. All right, no one's throwing food at me yet. Uh, I enjoy the chance to make food jokes uh, as we go. Um, so this really led us to uh, what I'm gonna talk about in the last couple of minutes here, which is this large scale fortification randomized controlled trial that we're doing together with the government of Tamil Nadu in India. Um, there are a, a whole variety of real science challenges to this project and we'll quickly reach the limits of what I know and what I can tell you about, but to give you a flavor of this, um, these challenges come from science, engineering, and industry. You have to choose a target staple that actually has adequate micronutrient carrying capacity. So a lot of work, a lot of policy emphasis in India is focused on salt, double fortified salt. Um, and turns out, I think it's, it's a, a reasonable conclusion that you just can't get enough iron in salt to really do something meaningful about iron deficiency anemia. You have to consider uh, not just uh, iron, but other micronutrients that people are or aren't getting, right? There are a variety of micronutrients which are important for proper absorption of ingested iron. Uh, these are all very important things. They're certainly not part of my expertise. Um, the target staple has to have very high population coverage. And this is particularly hard when you're dealing with very poor people, people that don't go to supermarkets and buy things uh, that are easy to hit with, uh, with fortified ingredients. Um, so this has been a very large collaborative effort with nutritionists, biochemists, food industry specialists, um, and as you can tell, of course, uh, triangulating from all of these perspectives, the choice of what to go for in Tamil Nadu is, uh, is rice. So how are we doing this specifically? Um, well, we're distributing fortified rice kernels through India's public distribution system. Um, fortified rice kernels 
Um, there are multiple actors in the game and they often don't make something exactly as advertised. If you're familiar with Ultra Rice, that was the one that I knew best, a path technology going in, then you know what we're talking about here. Um, fortified rice kernels are made from rice flour. Um, with this rice flour, one can add a premix. Uh, one can control the concentrations and sort of cocktail or combination of micronutrients that go into it. Then one shapes what essentially look like rice kernels using a process of hot extrusion. This is a process for making pasta, uh, for example. So pasta machinery to make these fortified rice kernels. And what you get is something uh, which, if you do it correctly, is something that is similar to actual rice in taste, texture, and appearance. Um, and so these concerns about acceptability then uh, obviously are paramount in the development of this technology. Um, and it's important to test that directly. Um, I can tell you war stories about that if you're interested. And then you blend it with conventional rice sort of at the appropriate ratio, right? So typically, and certainly one in the work we're doing is one of say one to 100 or so. So the idea is people get rice, they get the rice they'd be getting anyway, they eat it, and they're not even necessarily really aware that this is even there, um, and yet they're getting all of these micronutrients. Um, our distribution is through the public distribution system. Um, so. This is a centralized uh, government system, which is present in all states in India. It has centralized headwaters. That's where we do the mixing and the addition of these fortified rice kernels. Um, and then there is a supply chain which takes this rice down to village level fair price shops all across uh, the state. And this is true in every state, so all across the country. The PDS in Tamil Nadu is universal. Uh, everyone gets rice through the PDS. Um, it gives every household 20 kilograms of rice per month and for poor households an extra 15 kilograms of rice. The PDS in Tamil Nadu uh, accounts for more than half of all of rice consumed. So you're really getting it to people and you're getting it to everyone. Uh, so we're running this randomized controlled trial. There's a um, I have to confess, there's a more es esoterical, geeky, academic side to it, which is focused on really trying to estimate in quantitative terms the cost of behavior change. Uh, how much harder is it to get people to comply with vitamin regimens, say, rather than just fortifying their rice? Um, but we don't have time for that, such fun stuff. Um, this is a very large-scale RCT. Um, I think the most exciting thing about it from my perspective is it's funded directly in part by the government. Um, they're really putting their money where their mouth is. So they express commitment to scaling this up statewide uh, if the results from the RCT are positive and they're putting their money where their mouth is. Also has support from Tata Trust and the Global Innovation Fund. Um, if the results are promising, this is an inexpensive and scalable strategy that seems consistent with lessons from global population health history that I've tried to highlight about the difficulties of behavior change and not trying to change behavior when you don't have to. I think uh, when we talk a little bit about this in context of the previous discussion, and you know, certainly there are cases where maybe there's not a behavior constant strategy available to one. Um, I think this is a very exciting, um, a very exciting project. Uh, I hope you agree with me. I'm gonna stop there. Uh, I'm really interested to hear your uh, thoughts, comments, questions, um, concerns. Thank you. And I hope I caught us up on time a little bit, or, yeah? yeah. Okay. Thanks so much, Grant. Desiree, could you um, please come up, too? And I really like the way of this um, theme, central theme emerging about the importance of human behavior as it relates to global health. And both of you talked about the um, requirement for convening interdisciplinary groups in order to be able to get at some of these important questions. So um, we have microphones there, we have microphones here. Um, I encourage us to act like Stanford and start asking some questions. Uh, Desiree, uh, this is a question, well, it's not a question, it's a comment. Um, it, we're all here to build community and it takes a village. Um, so I thought I'd share, and I don't know if they're in the audience at all, but um, I don't know if you know of the work of Abby, well, Marin Granger Monson. Mm -hmm. Do you know her at all? Is Marin here? But Marin um, did a film called The Revolutionary Optimists, and it's about taking children in the slums. It took her three years to do it. She's a resident filmmaker here mm -hmm. in the bioethics 
uh, an, an MD in the Bioethics Center. It took her three years to do um, in Calcutta, India, taking slum kids and teaching them how to actually bring clean water sources. It's called the Revolutionary Optimist mm -hmm. and how to get polio immunization, 100% um, polio immunization. So you might want to talk with her as, as far as Thank you, yes. uh, behavioral change. And okay. then the other person, as far as it takes a village, do you know, is Abby King here? Or anyone from Abby's group at HRP? Mm -hmm. But Abby King um, is a professor at HRP um, and also the past president of the Society of Behavioral Change. And she has a program called Citizen Scientists, where she actually empowers citizens to change their health. So those might be two, I, I, is it Jenna, who's, who's yeah, your team? Yeah, uh -huh, absolutely, Who's your team yes. leader? Yeah, Jenna. Stand uh, up, Jenna. You, yeah, <laughs> hi. Um, you might, if you yeah, want, absolutely. I'll try to connect you to both Marin and Abby, because it really does, and this, I think that's what, this convening is supposed to be about networking. We just have such amazing talent at Stanford um, that it Thank would be great you, to bring them to the forefront. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name's Chelsea. I'm from Global Health Research nonprofit GiveWell, which is headquartered in San Francisco. And I have a question for Grant, which is, as you're implementing this RCT, what are the uh, sort of major political economy challenges you see to rolling this fortification process out? So some I can think of are like the government not paying for high quality iron over time, the government not having the technical capacity to like properly fortify rice um, or properly monitor the fortification of rice over time, uh, like public, Anyway, uh, private companies objecting to the fortification, how that affects their margins. So I'd be interested to hear how you and your team are working on that. Terrific, thanks. Um, Desiree got a, a comment that allowed her to say thank you and I get hard questions, so. <laughs> no, it's a wonderful question. Um, the short answer is I don't know all answers to what you're asking, but what I will tell you, and this was very present in our minds and actually uh, one of the funders, the Global Innovation Fund, um, the board member is actually here and teaches, I mean the chair of the board is actually here at Stanford and teaches a lot at the business school, um, for those of you who don't know. Um, we're very concerned about this as well. This is designed to be as close as possible to the real world version of the program that could exist, uh, conditional on positive findings. But there are you know, some questions that we just can't answer for sure. Um, so I think a big difference, and one that you hit on here, is that we are, we are procuring from a private supplier. Um, it's possible that the government could procure from a private supplier. There would be similar issues, I think, if you were procuring from a private supplier. But I think the likely outcome, if the government went big for 80 million people here on this, is that they would build their own uh, extrusion facilities. And the bottom line is, you know, we'd like to study how good of a job they do. But I will say, I think, uh, given that you have this in your mind, this is a, if you think about this project in context of all the other types of interventions you know of going on, this is one with maybe fewer moving parts than many other, right? You're just talking about taking this thing and getting into the race. You know, you're not talking about an army of people going around uh, houses and convincing everyone with different strategies to do, you know, it's, it's about as simple as it gets. And so trying to minimize the ability of um, the large scale version to get screwed up was, was very prominent in our minds. Um, what we will be doing actually, given that we're trying to work through actors in the public distribution system that could be part of screwing it up on large scale is that we're not actually trying to handhold them or make sure they're doing everything right. We're actually just trying to monitor the end result of what, what do they actually do. And so uh, doing our own quality testing along the way will help us to learn something about that. Um, but, uh, but I don't think there's a, a definitive cinching answer for you. Uh, well, thanks very much. Looking forward to the results. Thank you both. I just had a quick question about behavior change. and Maybe you could both uh, take a stab at it. Um, engaging behavior change is really, it's really critical to uh, kind of engage local expertise. And I was wondering if you could speak to that in, your, in the respective pop, uh, projects about how you go about finding people locally and how you go about creating uh, flexible networks that you can specialize to teach a different area but still keep the overall theme. Thanks. 
Yeah, so I think someone brought it up earlier, but I think global health is all about sort of networking and people and relationships. So in all the work we do, um, it generally starts with the, our partners on the ground. So I'm lucky enough to have been working in Kenya for a long time and have established some very deep and committed networks of local scientists who also are sort of in their own networks with other scientists and other um, community health providers and government officials. And so um, at the beginning of this project, we tried to think very broadly about all the people we needed at the table to start to design these interventions. Like we were t I had on the slide that we'd, we've done some, um, you know, some design workshops and so forth. And so um, we really, from, you know, because you're asking the how, right? So how do we go about doing it? I mean, we start with our local partners. We ask them who they think is critical and needs to be at the table. We think, you know, also, oh, maybe this person needs to be here. And so we end up with a very sort of diverse network of, um, we had teachers, um, people who were running NGOs on the ground who are interested in mosquito, um, sort of mosquito-borne disease. Um, we have... Um, Department of Education people, policy makers at the Ministry of Health, we've got our local expertise, the vector work people, the scientists, the social scientists who have done similar work in, in an area that's similar, and then we have a lot of sort of local contact experts also, because most of the people who we engage in our team are actually locals. So they carry two hats. They may be a scientist or a vector worker or a field worker, but then they're also just a person who lives right there. And so we got a lot of that expertise. So. Um, I think it, what you bring up is really important. I mean, in order to do any of this work, you really, especially when you're talking about behavior change and things like this, you really have to understand the perspectives of the community. And I think um, part of the way what we're starting to get to you know get this going is actually starting there with with all of these in-depth interviews and what are the community people thinking and then as we find oh we're missing someone that's really important we need the village leaders we need you know the clergy we need this we need that we add those people to our team. I hope that answers your question. I'll add on even though I think it's answered. So um, I, if I understood the question correctly, it's about how do you find uh, local champions, which are essential for behavior change strategies. Um, there's obviously less of that uh, in this specific project, but I think my answer to that would be um, networks and verification. And maybe here's what I mean by this. Um, uh, you need to start by getting some intelligence about who are prominent local actors, and that's very hard to know from the outside. So in this case, th thinking about my micronutrient deficiencies in Tamil Nadu, um, you know, I went early on and I talked to a guy named M.S. Swaminathan, who runs an institute based in Chennai. He's, you know, sort of a, a luminary in the entire area of food security. He's sort of one of the one of the fathers of green revolution technologies being introduced into India once upon a time. He has a network of what he calls community hung, uh, community hunger fighters. Um, these are community-based people. I wouldn't know of them or have access to them on my own. So I would start with someone like that, but then when I say verify, I would go out and I would actually talk to people, uh, you know, find the right way to talk to people, but go you know, to communities, meet and talk to these people and convince yourselves that they really are the local champions that, um, that they're advertised to, to be. Um, I wanted to add on uh, one comment to your question, though, which is that I think this is part of why, uh, because there certainly are examples of very successful behavior change campaigns. I didn't mean to imply otherwise, but it's part of why it's so hard on large scale, right? Because you've got to really fight it out community to community, and the answer and the person is going to be different in every single community in that case. So if you want to amplify that to, you know, you know, tens of thousands of villages, that becomes a very difficult uh, exercise if you have to go to every community and find the, the local champion. Not that it can't be done, it's just a, a lot harder. I want to thank um, Grant and Desiree for terrific presentations um, and, uh, and, and for their efforts um, in making their science so clear for all of us.